Welcome everyone. Uh, hello to uh, our audience uh, around the globe. Uh, this is a, a huge thank you to all of you for joining us um, on this webinar today, which is part of the Consumer Protection and Sustainability content series on ICE 365. Uh, a few weeks ago, we started with um, lots of content on responsible gambling that was alongside UK Safer Gambling Week. We're continuing now with a slightly long-term uh, look into the impact of gambling with discussions on uh, sustainability, ESG and industry reputation. My name is Eva Bakun. I'm the Director of Industry Insight and Engagement for Clarion Gaming. You can see me. I'm here only to welcome you, to let you know that you can use the Q&A functionality throughout the webinar uh, to put forward your questions, which we will be picking up. Um, and also to let you know that this webinar is uh, being recorded and the recording will be available for you to be listened to or share um, after the webinar. Um, now let me hand over to Stephen Myers from Praxis Consulting and Advisory. Uh, Stephen will be moderating uh, today's session uh, and is currently working with lots of private equity businesses, uh, advising them on gaming. Uh, after quite a few years in a senior leadership role at Genting UK. And I have been talking to Stephen about ESG, uh, as it is an increasingly um, an area of interest uh, for us at Clarion Gaming, reflecting the growing interest, obviously, um, in it from the industry. And that's really how the idea for this webinar came up. Uh, Stephen, thank you for joining us. Thank you to our other panelists, uh, who will all be um, introduced by Stephen. Um, and uh, over to you, Steve. Thanks, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me tell you a little about what we're going to plan over the next hour or so. I'm going to spend about five minutes uh, setting up our panel discussion. And you'll also be able to send in questions, I understand, for short Q&A, either at the end or we'll take the questions at an appropriate time. Um, in terms of my own background, as ever said, I, I've been in the game industry about 20 years, building my own reputation. I spent 13 of those as Managing Director Development at Genting, where I covered the EMEA region. And then I took a study break to do a master's at the University of Oxford, then set up my own company, Praxis Consulting and Advisory, which works entirely in either the gambling or leisure industry and increasingly in, ES, in the area of ESG. Um, I'm also a senior advisor on gambling to a company called DRD Partnership, which is a large strategic comms company based in London, uh, looking for value creation and protecting the reputations of clients. I'm also a graduate of the University of Nevada, Reno's uh, executive development program, where I also taught for a number of years. And I've got a lot of experience in talking to governments, politicians, authorities, and civil servants um, in terms of gambling. I have been fortunate that today I have seemingly avoided the five minutes needed to ruin my reputation. Um, but I was looking at this, um, looking for a good quote in terms of what I thought the gambling industry um, and reputation meant. And I came across a good one from Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, if you want to just put the slide up. Next one, I believe. It takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you will do things differently. Now, I know a lot of the iGaming uh, industry wasn't around 20 years ago, but it was around that time that the legal ramifications of some of the actions and some of the cross-border work that was happening at the time started to raise its head. Now, as I say, I've been fortunate that to date I've avoided my five minutes that needed to ruin my reputation. But I'm increasingly aware that in today's political and news hungry climate, the response to reputational risk is increasingly important. I think for the first time, the industry faces challenges that threaten its growth at best or its worst, its extinction in some markets. It's currently under attack and constantly on the back foot hindered uh, by an inconsistent narrative from the press and others on responsible gambling and along with its own messaging and sometimes own goals. There's a lack of public trust in our industry perpetuated by special interest groups, politicians, regulators and also some direct, direct actions of the industry itself. 
In fact, I recently saw a report that said only 5% of the public trusted the gambling industry. And that's the scale, that's the scale of the task faced when we're looking at reputational challenges. The industry and major players like our panelists in particular does a lot of good things and we'll hopefully peel back some of these issues in our discussion and look at how these challenges for the future can be met. It's, there's no doubt, you know, the gambling industry is proficient in AML, KYC, CSR and enhanced due diligence, but I think it faces a more holistic and strategic challenge when we look at ESG issues. Combined environmental, social and governance requirements are evolving quickly and they're increasingly becoming part of the reporting suite and requirements and accounting advisory firms are ramping up the reporting standards accordingly. ESG has also, I think, become a key measurement tool of many investors, seeing this more and more. Asset managers, listed entities and others are facing narrowing investment opportunities because of this. And if they don't approach the business cycle responsibly across a broad ESG spectrum, the opportunities are few and far between. So this panel discussion comes to an important time to look to address these evolving requirements and how the industry adapts to tighter regulation and reporting needs. Reputation is the key to this and sustainability, I think, will only be achieved if CSR and ESG requirements are delivered. In my mind, I think I also see this as an opportunity, really, for those forward thinking companies to buy into these measures at the strategic and executive management level. I'm looking forward to hearing to our, from our panel on this. Um, leadership from the very top of an organization is needed as sustainability can mean many different things to many different companies. And we'll hopefully get a better understanding of what this means to our panel. Finally, looking at what the future could look like in five to 10 years time, I think is an appropriate timing at the moment. So can the industry really shape its own future rather than fail at the expense of politicians, regulators, public health officials and others? Could data be its saviour? But will it be adopted across the board to provide the evidence-based research that's not out there at the moment to promote a genuine discourse on responsibility and reputation? Hopefully we can address at least some of these points as we go into our discussion. So, okay, let me introduce our panel this afternoon. Um, we've got Anna Jain, Camilla Wright, Martin Lichka, and Herman Parminger. And uh, Anna, why don't you tell you a little bit about yourself and, and your company? Yeah, sure, I'll do that. Um, I am the Sustainability Manager at Kindred Group, responsible for our um, global sustainability framework, so covering all our brands and all our jurisdictions. Um, I've been with Kindred Group th since 2010 in various roles um, and sustainability manager since 2017, where we really started increasing our um, efforts, I would say, on a more global level on the area. So I'm uh, responsible for our framework, uh, strategy, communication, reporting uh, across the group. Okay, thank you. Let's. Uh go across the water to New York, Martin. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning to anybody who just like me happens to indeed be at the other end of the pond. My name is Martin Lechka. I look after Entain's American regulatory affairs as well as responsible gambling. And on top of that, following Entain's branch out into the world of esports, I also happen to be looking after esports regulatory matters across the globe. Thanks for having me and for those of you who may not know Entain, because uh, by our own admission, we do seem to change our corporate name quite often, but Entain's the one we're going for in the long run. Lately, we've had the dubious pleasure of being rather haunted to be wanted, but we will continue on our own path and hopefully Hopefully, we will continue contributing towards the ESG courses. That's certainly the plan that Stephen has talked about as an introduction to this panel. Thanks, Martin. Uh, Camilla, who's sometimes in Dubai, sometimes in London. Hi. Um, yes, I'm a partner in Red Knot Communications, which is a boutique uh, PR firm specializing in sports, sports betting and gaming. Uh, we were set up by, I guess, me and four friends in the industry with 
different skill sets to uh, I guess try and bring a different approach to communications in in this sector. My background is uh, more mainstream media. I was a journalist for many years, writing for publications across uh, broadsheets in Britain and America, uh, magazines. I set up a, my own digital uh, publication called Popbitch. So I spent many many years, I guess, trying to uh, attack the reputations of the rich and powerful in the world. And now I'm having a go at. Uh, trying to show uh, companies and uh, brands within this industry how they uh, best talk to the media and get their story story across to them. Thanks Camilla and last but not least Herman in Austria. <laughs> Hi there, uh, my name is Herman Paminger, thank you for having me this afternoon. Um, I'm the Secretary General for the European Casino Association that's basically the association of the land-based casino industry in Europe and uh, beyond uh, in Brussels, uh, representing some 900 casinos from 28 countries, some 50,000 employees. Um, I started in the gaming industry in 1991 uh, and um, Secretary General is my second job. My first job is I work for Casinos Austria and Austrian Lotteries in the public affairs field. And uh, that's everything from my side. Okay, thank you, panel. Uh, so, okay, let's move on to the discussion then. We'll start with the sort of sustainability and ESG question. I suppose, Anna, your, as your role of, uh, is all about sustainability in the Kindred Group, can you explain what sustainability means to you and your company? Yeah, sure, I can, I can have a go. Um, I think for us, sustainability is, is really about um, how we can create value for all our stakeholders. So not only customers, but also looking at entries, um, shareholders, local communities, uh, partners, like uh, clubs we sponsor. So really having a broad view on, on uh, everyone we interact with. And we try to articulate in our sustainability work what it is we we stand for and when where we think we can deliver value um, because we we really believe that that's how we can um, we can build trust with our uh, stakeholders and I'm sure we'll come back to to discuss more on, on building trust and how how important that is for for our industry more than ever right now um, so I think that's very high level how, how we look at sustainability now, you've been in the news recently with um, uh, being at the forefront of the responsible gambling piece in terms of your road to zero uh, by 2023, um, which is obviously a natural focus for both those inside and outside the industry. However, I think ESG is now evolving across a wider range of subjects. What is Kindred doing to address areas such as governance, diversity and environmental issues? So what, what we did back in, in 2016, actually, is we, we did a very comprehensive materiality assessment to understand what are the material topics we need to look at for our stakeholders. So the outcome of that assessment was 15 material topics. Obviously, responsible gambling is, is one of the top topics. Interestingly, cybersecurity is actually almost at the same level. Um, but obviously it's also integrity, AML, sports booking, sports book integrity, um, but also topics as you mentioned here. So if we look at governance, that's a key point for us. We, we've implemented a sustainability council, um, which is uh, reporting into our board of directors and that really helps us embed uh, sustainability into our uh, business and decision making. We've also made sure that all our employees are measured on sustainability performance. So if you're on a bonus in Kindred Group, uh, a percentage of that will be measured against our sustainability targets. Um, and then obviously integrated into our company objectives and uh, driving our strategy. So really trying to have it integrated throughout the business. Um, from an uh, environmental point of view, I think we've um, that has been a topic for us for many years um, on different levels because we are a digital company, so our footprint is fairly limited. But what we do see is that this is a um, 
it's a huge topic, especially for investors, actually, maybe because this is one where there are standards uh, that you can actually report on. So we do um, we do take our responsibility in contributing towards um, Paris Agreement, now Glasgow Agreement, um, quite seriously. So we, we, we've set up science-based targets and we track uh, quite uh, thoroughly how we, how we um, proceed on those targets. And then I think the last one you talked about was diversity. And that is actually one of the key points in our sustainability framework, which also came out in our materiality assessment. So we're, we've now, the last couple of years, gone away from looking just at gender diversity, which I think has been the main discussion in our industry, but actually looking more broadly on how we can be more inclusive in, in our company and in the industry as a whole. So how can we make sure that we reflect our customers and our society to a greater extent, which I don't think is the case um, today, to be honest. Okay, thank you. Um, if we perhaps move on to more geographical issues and applications of sustainability, Martin, you're obviously in New York, um, and we've heard from Anna regarding their wider ESG framework and initiatives she's involved in. Do you see any differences in the US market? It's a different culture, it's a different product to an extent out there. I do see differences, but perhaps I would start by pointing out to Anna's point that as an industry and as individual operators, what's critical to my mind is to lay down very strong foundations when it comes to all the topic areas that the two of you have been discussing responsible gambling, diversity, environmental, environment related issues. So I would suggest that the foundations are absolutely critical, but to your point, Stephen, indeed, we would fail again as an industry and as individual operators, most of us being, of course, big listed companies, if we rather foolishly thought to apply these standards across the board in sort of a one-size-fits-all way. And yes, America is very different from Europe when it comes to cultural idiosyncrasies. It's also very different when it comes to certain cultural sensitivity. So all this needs to be arguably thrown into the mix so that the local needs are properly addressed. And again, when I'm talking about the needs, I'm talking about customers, I'm talking about our staff, I'm talking about the public at large and the individual stakeholders that we are, we are constantly or we constantly talk to. What I would also say, if I may, that uh, the fact that uh, sports betting is at an uh, the popularity of sports betting seems to be at an all-time high here in the United States because it's still quite a novelty so that novelty factor has not perhaps worn off yet presents the industry with a huge opportunity to sort of reinvent itself because indeed for a number of years going to the Warren Buffett's uh, quote that uh, you have so pertinently used, Stephen. And in in my view, I believe that in, in Europe, I'm, I'm by no means saying that everything would have gone per shape, but unfortunately a lot of things had in the past and the industry has worked extremely hard, in my view, to address these issues in the last four to five years. So the reason, the main reason I'm saying that America and let's let's even say the boy the Americas, not just the US market, but also the likes of Canada and Latin America. The reason why this is such a huge opportunity, even brushing the commercial opportunity aside, I think that much is, is very clear and everybody would read and hear about it every every single day. Yet another market that's that's regulated. But there's also a huge opportunity from the sustainability perspective, because still to quite some extent, the US markets, when it comes to responsible gambling in particular, is a blank canvas. And that gives us a lot of rigor room to address these issues, do it in the right way, benefit from the lessons we've learned in the European markets and also benefit from the 
technology that across the industry we have been deploying. So my perhaps aspiration may be too strong a word at this stage, perhaps a dream if not a wet dream, is that when it comes to sustainability, given the cultural context, the US and the wider Americas will start leading within the industry, but at the same time, crucial and critically, this leadership will rub off of what's been happening in Europe, and this will start working like a two-way traffic. Because uh, what is great here is the fact that uh, many decision makers have had the opportunity to learn about our industry afresh. So they may not necessarily be shouldering some of the prejudice of the past. So they're a bit more open-minded. So I'm hopeful that, and it will be hard work, don't get me wrong, but if as an industry, we can deliver in the United States and the wider Americas, it will help us with our still rather tainted reputation in, in Europe, and it will help us open hearts and minds of the regulators and other decision makers at the old continent as well. Well, I think that's an interesting point. I mean, in the US, I mean, I spoke about 5% of people trust the industry in the UK in terms of recent report. It's much higher in the US and there's not the same stigma as, as there is in Europe, I think, uh, with regards to that. But what differences, just quickly, have you seen between different states as they vary their approach in terms of how they approach online and iGaming? Well, first of all, and very, very briefly, yes, it's it's great that the public trusts the US industry at the same time, and that's why we'll need to continue working very hard, I would suggest. Any misstep may take us down the slippery slope of what we've been seeing, seeing elsewhere, so it's not as though it was all, all hunky-dory, and there may be a few con controversial issues simmering underneath the surface and the onus is on the industry together with the likes of the regulators and our customers to make sure that they do not bubble over. And to your question, Stephen, well, I, I, it may be naive, but I always try to think about the United States as, well, as what, what's, uh, what's on that particular tin. It's United States, so there are 50 states here and all of them are relatively different, of course, being held together by a number of principles that they hold for self-evident. So just like we've seen in Europe, I would suggest that a broad brush approach will not work. We need to go not only for regulatory reasons, but also from the sustainability and CSR and responsible gambling perspective, state by state. Some states are a bit more open-minded to the use of technology, and it's very clear to me also that just like uh, in uh, connection with all other gambling and sports betting related matters, the Garden State of New Jersey, right there across the river, is the leader in this space. So that's always the, the place to start and many other states will likely, will likely follow while reflecting their individual approaches. So that would be my take. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, I suppose, let's move on to the merits of evidence base and in terms of reputational strategy. And Camilla, both Entain and Kindred have been at the forefront of creating an evidence base within the data work they're doing now, particularly in terms of sustainability and reputational issues. What merit does this have when you represent clients and how do you create an attractive brand proposition in such an environment? Also, I mean, what is required where there is a reputational issue to respond to in that regard? I think in terms of how it affects a client's brand proposition in regards to markets, investors, regulators, yeah, there's a, I think there's a great merit in developing evidence-based uh, data collection and usage. Uh, I think Kindred and Entain should be applauded for these efforts. I think showing that a business is investing time and money and innovating in uh, reputational issues and in its its operations um, can only be good for the companies involved, but not only that, it strengthens the whole brand proposition of the industry. So I think um, we would strongly, strongly advise uh, companies that this is a, 
I guess it's almost approaching terminal for a big company now not to look at this, that uh, social considerations and governance are such an issue that uh, it's, it's almost the, the minimum you have to do in order to look like a responsible company. But I think it's a slightly different proposition when you're looking at reputational issues with the media and the, the general public. I don't think this cuts through quite as strongly and anything that uh, smacks at the moment of attempts at self-regulation rather than external regulation can, it doesn't quite capture the pop popular mood right now. And I think it's not just for gaming, this is for any industry that, that's involved in this, whether it's uh, tech or media, financial markets. I mean, you've only got to look at the problems uh, Boris Johnson got into trying to, I guess, regulate himself rather than subject parliament to any outside scrutiny the last couple of weeks to see how uh, the media and the public jump on that. So um, I think it's a, it's a evidence base is enormously important in a kind of corporate and public affairs strategy, but in terms of a media strategy, it's probably not going to make a massive difference to, to the companies involved. Okay, thank you. Um, Herman, uh, you represent the land-based casino industry through the ECA. You've got 28 members, 70,000 staff. What is the ECA's thoughts on reputation and how to promote the responsible gambling stroke, responsible company message? I mean, does it or should it um, differ from that of iGaming? Well, the thing is, you know, and I want to point that out really, you know, um, there is no difference between land-based and online. We are all in the same boat as, as uh, much as uh, the reputation of the gaming industry is concerned. If the reputation goes down, uh, basically, if there is one uh, black sheep, you know, doing the wrong thing, it affects all of us. It, it affects the whole business. And this is what we see. And I can tell you, you know, from the European Casino Association side, uh, it's basically what we are dealing with. You know, we want uh, our industry, you know, to be a reputable industry and we want to be able to talk to people. We want to talk to the stakeholders. We want to talk to regulators and we want to be listened to. And the thing is, if you lose our reputation, you know, they, they will, you know, they will start not listening to us and they will turn maybe a blind eye on us and they will say we'll act like sheriff and sheriffs and say hey we're going to regulate them you know we are just you know we make our mind up and and decide and this is what the european casino association is doing basically you know we have our three columns where we uh, give information you know do surveys uh, give the correct data and so on uh, to have an evidence-based um information that you can really make then decisions on and build an opinion on of course we do also marketing what what is uh, good the industry does and what social impact we have and what impact we have on uh, with our employees and uh, with uh, the environment and with uh, our suppliers and so on and then there is this very important point and Anna said everything that needs to be said to that. This is CSR, ESG standards that you have and that you follow, you know, that give the evidence, you know, that you do everything in the right way. And if there are companies, and I think also in the land-based industry, there are companies that are doing the right things in the right way and give an example. And we want others basically to follow this example and uh, be uh, on the same side uh, of the piece of paper or whatsoever. So uh, the European Casino Association, you know, for many years we are part of the United Nations Global Compact. That's a very easy approach, you know, to start with thinking about your uh, SDGs, you know, with your goals, your ethical goals, your environmental goals, your standards and so on. Um, and we also do our diversity and inclusion programs. You know, uh, you mentioned EDP, you know, this uh, program of executive development program. We try to send um, people who are interested to get a career in our industry who are on the last move to go to top management, you know, by diversity criteria and inclusion criteria and send them there and finance this. And, uh, and of course, you know, on a, on a smaller scale, you know, in the companies, like uh, we do all the things, like in Casinos Austria and Austrian Lotteries, we do have our 
metro reality metrics. You know, we talk to our stakeholders, we have our conferences about that, about that. And you need to do that. But one thing is very important. You know, we all know what we are talking about. But how do you communicate that to the public? You know, even to regulators, you know, uh, try to explain materiality matrix to the public and nobody will get you. It's basically something that you can do and it's important that you do it because it proves and in the long run it's the right strategy, but it cannot replace, you know, that you do the right things. And very important uh, to us is also, you know, CSR is about or SDG or whatever is about, you know, how you earn your money and not how you spend the money that you have already earned. You know, it's basically how you earn your money. And uh, there it's very important. And the main thing that we have to deal with is the responsible gaming thing. And here I see also, you know, that um, standards are very important because the standards gives you the ability to prove that you're doing the right things and you're doing them right and you have to get your standards certified. And this is not only true for responsible gaming, you know, this also is true for any anti-money laundering things that you have implemented and so on. So our recommendation is, you know, get the things in, uh, do them right, have them audited, you know, get certified. Good, thanks. Yeah, I think do the right thing is a good motto. I think um, it needs to come from the very top of the organization down so it doesn't feel like a box ticking exercise and it's integrated into, into a business. Let's, let's, let's move more broadly in the discussion now. Let's talk about protection against market sensitivity. Um, in recent weeks, we've seen it doesn't seem a couple of days go by without a number of events in the industry that have had major consequences on share prices of companies, grey market activity, legacy issues through acquisition or data integrity breaches. It seems every other day something's coming up with regards to that. How can companies, this is for the group as a whole, the panel as a whole, how can companies protect against the sensitivity markets have seen and will continue to see in the future surrounding these issues? Um, I don't mind starting here. I mean, I don't think you can protect yourself, but uh, one thing I will say that is markets hate surprises. And as part of uh, governments, governments uh, clarity and transparency goes a long way. There are legacy issues, uh, but I think in many cases we would advise companies to look at things like this as a, as a sticking plaster. It's better to pull it off fast, let the market know what's going on, show how your business practices have evolved and the world has changed since these things have happened. Um, you can't undo things that have happened and you can't pretend things are different to, to the realities. But um, do it fast. The, the, the pain will have gone, the market will move on, they will adapt and uh, you can let your uh, new skin heal and uh, grow underneath. And uh, I think there's, uh, there's, there's definitely some, uh, some brownie points to be gained from uh, being a business that is willing to, to face up to some of the the grey market issues openly. I, th I think to that point as well and to what Martin already mentioned is there's so much importance in getting the fundament fundamentals in place, ensuring that you have um, good governance, that you've built in accountability and that you have a strong platform that you're communicating from so that if you have a legacy issue or, 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 or the, that you have a very strong platform to communicate from, that you've been tra transparent about your business model, that you've shown how you've actually improved your operations over the, over the years. Um, yeah. And I believe perhaps at the risk of stating the very obvious that it also actually requires some courage lock up the courage and go and do the right thing. It probably sounds very obvious, but for years and years, this industry has uh, had a rather different reputation. And I will sound like a broken record, but I believe it needs to be said again. The, the, the industry has gone through a massive metamorphosis, but it di did require a lot of courage, I would suggest. And it also required a massive cultural change because Ultimately, just like in any other sector, 
we are involved in running businesses and business sustain themselves by making money, by making profit. But what we've started moving towards is making profit in a long-term sustainable and more sensible way. So we have embarked upon that journey. Most of the operators across the industry have plucked up the courage. So now we need to we need to persist. So that's what in my view it comes down in let's say human terms, if you will, or psychological ones. Yeah, it's I would like to be the something to may I add something Stephen, yeah, sure. before we go on? Um, I think uh, I agree with what, with what Martin said, and uh, they have, yeah, they had it has developed very well, you know, the gaming uh, industry and so on, and it's growing, you know, especially in the US and so on. But one thing, you know, if you want to protect against sensitivity, you also have to discuss, you know, where are we going and what do we want, you know, and there you have to look at, you know, maximizing the profits, you know, maximizing the uh, revenues maximizing the GGR, whatever you call it, you know, is the one thing. Sensitivity gets bigger, you know, if if you are always going for to max it out. You have to really consider, you know, what is this market worth? What is the optimum gaming uh, revenue that this market can, in a sustainable way, provide? You know, and if we go beyond that, you know, the ses sensitivity will. Uh, increase exponentially you know like other things in these days uh, very soon and we are i think you know with all the gaming that is going on and with some players that are not considering this you know um, we have the potential threat you know that this is overdone or that uh, you know that we will have some problems from that thanks Evan. I think um, it, it strikes me as as uh, the sensitivity of markets is now driven completely differently, and this shows where the world moves to. Twenty years ago, when when I joined the industry, I worked for a listed casino company at the time, and we played to the VIP market. And if we lost four or five million in a night, we literally had to put a profit warning out the next day. Share price had dropped five, ten p, whatever it was. The player would then come back in that next evening and, and leave most of it back with us, yet there was no recompense in the share price the day after. But that was the obsession of the sensitivity then. The world has now changed and we've moved into these areas that, you know, we are, you know, completely looking at responsibility. So let's look at how we might get that message out. You know, gambling is seen generally as a sin stock. You know, how can the industry be transformed from in areas it's all time low in terms of public perception and what can it do to get the message out there we're all saying that we're all trying to do the right thing how do we get the message out i suppose camilla you're a natural go to on 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 this one to start with I think it, yeah, I think what everyone's saying is true. There's a, there's been a sea change in the industry, and there has been uh, genuine attempts to to look at problem gaming and uh, and how things are done. But the message is probably not getting out to the media and the public. There's, I guess, what, if you look back at sort of Brexit as an example, um, on one side you had evidence based uh, processes, you had statistics you had uh, experts, on the other side, you had a kind of general sense and feeling like uh, a perception, um, or was it take back control? And when you're dealing with a kind of a non-evidence-based um, public perception, it's very difficult to fight that with uh, purely uh, statistical or um, innovative uh, attempts at controlling public, public uh, problem gambling. So I think that the gaming industry, in order to make uh, make the make the media or the public narrative change, has to do something very big. I always uh, call it um, a clause four moment. It's like back in the 1990s. Uh, there's nothing that the Labour Party could do to to convince the media or the public that they weren't the sort of socialist relics of the past. Until Tony Blair, Neil Kinnock, John Smith, they just they just never made any headway, no matter what good they did. And Tony Blair came along and said, "Right, we're going to do something. We're going to we're going to take away clause four of our um, of our constitution. We're going to take away the the uh, 
the nationalization of industry clause, which was nothing that anybody was clamoring for. And there wasn't any kind of public perception that this was a really big deal, but it, it, it made the Labour Party look like, a, when they did it, look like a very, very different thing. And after that, it was only a year later that a lot of the media went on their side, they got into the um, landslide election in 1997. And obviously, it's not, uh, it's not comparable in terms of uh, what you can do in the gaming industry. It's just in order to shift the dial in terms of a media or public narrative, um, something big has to change. I, I, I don't know what, but I think it's something for the gaming industry as a whole to have a look at. I suppose with both Entain and with Kindred, there has been a bit of a paradigm shift in terms of sort of taking responsibility in terms of using the data in a way that can give you an evidence base. And I think one, from my perspective, everyone talks about evidence, but shows very little of it. And what data is out there is not presented as well as it could be because it's challenged all the time and it needs to find, you know, people. And I think Kindred in particular um, with the road to zero have, have given some measurement. People are, some people don't like it, but at least they've taken a route that is saying we will measure ourselves on this basis. And uh, I think that's starting to do it. And I think if some of the leading companies do that, it will naturally force some of the other players to, to do so. And I think to that point, it's, I mean, we're on a, a journey, right? I mean, it's, it's taken years to come to that level of, of transparency and being comfortable with that. So to, to Martin's point, earlier about being courageous and it, it's it's very much out of uh, the comfort zone of the industry I think to be very transparent and share data and share methodology so and and it was a big step for us as well to go public with the journey to zero but we've I mean obviously seen a, a few negative points but overall actually been surprised how positively it's been received by by most stakeholder groups so I think that I mean, yeah, the more transparent we can really be about our operations and, and put data to that, uh, the, the more we can drive that change. I think um, I'm just going to move on. I was going to keep this question a little later, but you've just sort of opened up an avenue that I didn't want to talk about. It's the harmonization of data hmm. for use, particularly in regulatory uh, decisions. I'd like to ask the panel, you know, do they think that's going to be possible to do? I mean, there are various things fringing on this with um, things like affordability on the horizon, how that data is kept. What is, I'd like to know the views of the panel in, term, in terms of that. I, I can start. Um, I, I think it's possible, but it is very difficult. Um, I think it's on most big operators agenda at least we're having conversations with uh, competitors about this as well um, and and from our point of view at least we, we very much like to see some common standards across the industry but also very importantly across jurisdictions because what we're also seeing right now is regulators doing very specific things for their markets which is also not um, not helpful so I think it would be very beneficial if we had more standardized um, regulations and standards uh, across jurisdictions that, that operators can then lean on. Um, and, and we see it in a, in a lot of other industries and areas, so, so I'm sure we could get there, just not saying it's easy. <laughs> Martin, you, you obviously, you've employed ARC now as, as your uh, entain, sustain, part of your entain sustained vehicle. What were your views on that? I may be biased, but I <clears throat> truly believe that ARC and similar tools are very, very powerful tools and platforms that will allow not only Entain, but ultimately the whole industry to define the roots or the root causes of problem gambling and will allow us to intervene even earlier and even faster than we would have in the pre arc area if you will so it's mo mo most certainly the way to go we're talking about data technology what i would add to that however is the fact that we're still talking about human beings and i don't think there are any codes that would 
help us figure out how people, perhaps that there will be in the future, uh, how people feel when they gamble. So that element must not be neglected either. And the reason I'm bringing it up is that I believe it's intimately linked with the journey and with the message that with the journey we've been on and the messages that we are conveying to the public. And I don't disagree with your description of gambling, Stephen, as a thin stock. But at the same time, I would strongly argue that a lot of people would say that they actually, if not love, they enjoy betting or gambling, and most of them can do it in a very, very sensible way. So actually, Camilla was absolutely right with her albeit sad Brexit related example or the Labour Party one. You know, it comes down to simplifying the message, perhaps finding or identifying the Tony Blair of the gambling industry, whoever whoever that may be. And that's exactly the challenge we're facing. Now is there a critical mass of people out there who would be prepared to go public with the very simple message, which is we enjoy betting. We do understand that it needs to be regulated. We do understand that it needs to be structured in a sustainable way that protects us, including protecting us from ourselves if need be. But the bottom line, and that's where, in my view, the narrative needs to shift to, is that betting is, by nature and implication, a risky activity, but it can be managed. So people should not be automatically labeled gambling addicts if they admit to enjoy gambling and betting. Where, that's, where the, I'm coming, that's, the, that's the paradigm that needs to change. Yeah, yeah, where I'm coming from is, you know, you're both doing a lot of work to identify and prevent people developing issues and problems with gambling. If you can, you know, if, if the goose lays the golden egg, and the fact, and you can find this route through data to stop that. Why can't the industry share that? You know, why can't I intend share with Kindred, with the ECA, with many other companies to for the greater good in terms of proving that point to regulators, politicians? I mean, politicians, to be fair, probably got a, a bad reputation because they're fed only certain facts. They need the evidence base and they need some proper academic research to be able to say, well, actually, we disagree with someone who is against gambling, for example, or a special interest group. But at the moment, they don't have that objectivity with them. Herman, I mean, I, I don't want to say you've been on a few rodeos, but, you know, obviously the, the online iGaming industry has been around the last 20 years or so. Obviously the land-based industry has been around longer. What are your views on that? I think you're on mute. Um, sorry, you know, this is what Erin said when we were preparing for this. Um, uh, no, I, I just want to say that, yes, of course, the online industry, you know, wants to have everything the same, the whole world, one system, you know, fits all. But unfortunately, this is not how the world works. You know, we are so different. The land-based industry has grown, you know, in countries and countries have made their laws, regulations and so on. They have their culture and so on. They're different. And in the online industry, I, I understand that, you know, it's a computer program and it gets cheaper, you know, if you have a one fits all responsible gaming program, you know, and you can implement it in the USA and you can implement it in Liechtenstein and you can implement it in Dubai. But this is not the case. It will not be the case in the future. And all these harmonization talks, you know, I don't think that they will lead to success. They will lead to more suspicion about the gaming industry. What are they planning for? What are they aiming at? You know, what should you know be the end of it? Um, I think that uh, the online gaming industry 
what I strongly believe is there, there are operators out there that set the examples about sustainability, CSR, and all these things. And others need to follow that if they want to be successful and if they want to have regulators to talk to them and to listen to them. Okay. And um, and with with that approach, you know, others will follow. And I think that that is the way forward. We we are entering a very dangerous area right now. The European Union is discussing taxonomy, and I'm sure you are all reading about this and so on. And the thing sorry. is, it will be sorry for that. It, it will be now. Everything is ringing. The EU Commission call in Herman. <laughs> yeah, I'm the sorry. EU wanted yeah, to maybe. harmonize everything, Herman. Yeah. I cannot stop this, I'm sorry. They've gone back on the explicit um, use. I'm of... very sorry for that. Taxonomy. No problem. You know, and in the taxonomy that is currently under discussion, the gambling industry is excluded, you know, like the weapon industry, yeah, like tobacco. And if, you know, if this goes through, uh, it will be harder, you know, for being in the gaming industry, you know, getting funds, getting credits, you know, getting the banks to work with you and so on, it will be more expensive. And therefore, it's very important now to project a picture of a very reputable industry that knows what it is doing, that knows what needs to be done to be sustainable and so on. And you know, and we are in the boat together. Land-based, online, online casinos, online lotteries, online uh, sports betting. And we need to join forces to get the message out that this is a sustainable, responsible, compliant, licensed industry. I think um, that's an interesting point uh, in terms of, if we look at, if we move on to ESG versus investability, um, increasingly, we've seen a situation where asset managers in particular will want to put money into certain companies based on certain criteria. And by doing that, that may actually make the cost of cop capital cheaper, et cetera, et cetera, for, for, for the company concerned. So in terms of our industry, is it possible to create a robust business model that will allow asset managers to continue to invest in gambling? And can ESG be used as an opportunity to do this? If I, I may, like... I, I, I believe so. I think it's a, it's a no brainer. ESG is both a challenge, uh, will sound cheesy, but it's both a challenge and a huge opportunity and one of my fellow panelists apologies i've forgotten who's made that point perhaps anna might have uh, whoever's left behind will get stuck there and shall not be able to to catch up it's inevitable that uh, there will always be for want of better expression rotten apples in our barrel but as long as and that's very much the intention of fontaines i Surely it's a very much the intention of Kindred, many other operators across the board to keep raising the bar. And then the investors will get to see that, the public will get to see that, the customers will get to see that. And I reckon what will ultimately accelerate the process is the fact that uh, generations Z and all the other younger generations, they very truly belief in, in sustainability that's how they've been that's how they've been brought up and that's what they're looking for the when it comes to their at this stage i suppose rather consumer choices than investments but they will land in a position whereby they i'm sure will have some spare money to invest and the ethical aspects of any industry is ever so increasingly significant to them and we're not very far from the point whereby this generation are the investors at which point all this will blend into into one set of factors that will be in my view heavily influenced by ethics much more than it would have been in the past yeah absolutely okay let me 
I'm just conscious of the time, which we're running very short of now. Just let, let's move to the future and look at the industry in the next five to 10 years. Um, I'll start off with you, Anna. Where, where do you think the sector will be in five to yen, 10 years time, wearing either your own or your kindred hat? I will take on uh, my positive kindred hat. Um, I think, I actually do think, I mean, if we look back 10 years and look at where we are today, huge uh, changes have happened in the industry. Uh, thinking back to when I started in then Unibet Group, it's a completely different operations today. So I, I do believe if all operators and, and regulators and suppliers, this is not just a task for, for operators, I think it's a, a crucial point as well. This is across the board. But if we all manage to pull in the same direction to really prove our value to communities, I, I, I truly think that will impact public perception. But but um, but I'm back to, to Martin's point now. It, this is a it's not just a consumer d demand. It's also about how do we get talent to work for us. Uh, so that from a lot of points, it's not we're not around in ten years if we don't manage to um, to climb this together. So I, I um, yeah, with my positive hat, I do think that if we manage to prove the value that we also bring to, to not just customers, but to the communities we're in, we will, um, we will manage to impact public perception. Okay. Thank you. Herman? Uh, well, you know, on, on the one hand, I would like to say and I'm not that positive, unfortunately, because our industry, the land-based industry, is coming out of the pandemic. Um, and it's public knowledge we have been locked uh, down for uh, many months in 2020. Also in 2021, we are now having the fourth wave. You know, in Austria, we are in a lockdown. Casinos are closed at least till the 12th of December. So it's a bad situation. And, you know, things were happening in the meantime. We went in our statistics from having employed 70,000 people FDs in, in Europe to 50,000 at the moment. Yeah. Um, although we got uh, also the assistance of uh, national governments and so on, you know, but still. And uh, so the next uh, few years will be tough. And uh, um, we, we are sure we will come back. We will come back with tourism. We will come back, you know, with uh, new products, but we will also come back, you know, maybe with new channels. And the thing is also that, uh, uh, you know, we know that 65% uh, of our um, members, you know, run an online operation, either directly or within the group uh, they are basically representing. So um, this is something, you know, that we hope uh, and we are exploring and uh, which should make our industry also more resilient. And uh, I think, you know, towards general topics, you know, we really need to get together and uh, get our messages out and uh, work on our reputation, you know, to keep it up high and not to be steered by regulators only, but basically by evidence-based decision making. Okay, thank you. Martin, obviously you may have a different perspective sitting in the US. Well, it's not as though this would be a complete walk in the park, you know, the, the roses in the garden may fade as well. But yeah, I believe that the, the US, looking specifically at the, at the US industry, it's all been going very well, but if I were to, I don't mean to be sounding any alarms, but the industry needs to be careful because the novelty factor will start, <coughs> inevitably start bearing off. And to Anna's point, if any gambling industry, including the US industry, wants to be here in five and 10 years time, it will, in my view, need to do th two things. Be very sustainable about its full operation. And then the second thing is being open-minded about the demands, I talked about the younger generation of customers, not only from the ethics perspective, but also from the products perspective. Now, I'm sure everybody would have heard about the likes of 
Disney, Sega, all these companies, let's see what the likes of Amazon, Google and others may do in this space, but these companies have already publicly stated that they would like to get involved, if I'm not misquoting one of them, even aggressively involved in this space. So there is a whole new dynamic developing to which the existing industry will need to react. So as a quick example, Antane is now branching into into esports and we are trying to transform ourselves into a broader entertainment company so hopefully then perhaps this is the short answer to your question about where we will be in five ten years from now mm. you know the nature of the of the industry and the individual operators will be very very different from all sorts of perspectives thanks yeah the disney thing was a bit of a u-turn from their previous stance um Camilla, you obviously see it across a number of different clients. What are your views on this? I think where we're at at the moment is a sort of overreact. You, you talked about the 5% of uh, British people, I think it was British uh, public um, approving of or, or, or saying positive things about the gambling industry. I think this is possibly, um, a, I guess, a pendulum swinging one way after um, the massive growth of the industry from 2005. I think as Martin is alluding to, this might happen in the States already, but we're horizon scanning five, 10 years into the future. So in Britain as a society, gambling is woven deep into the fabric of society. I mean, Grand National, bingo, football pools, it's perfectly normal to be talking about odds on who the next James Bond is, uh, who's going to win money on if it's a white Christmas, things like that. Uh, I don't think there's going to be, there's not a concerted effort to get rid of gambling. I think gambling is going to have a strong, uh, a strong place in the future. But I would see in five to 10 years, it's going to be smaller. It's going to be better run. And I think that everything that the panelists have said today on sustainability, um, governance and uh, how uh, the tools to track data will will bolster that. So I would say that the, there's in my the, the, it's always the darkest before the dawn. And I think in five to ten years uh, the gaming industry will be in quite a strong place. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks to all our panelists today. We've we've run out of time. I think it's been a wide ranging debate on what certainly difficult issues. And there's no doubt that, in my mind, that the leaders in our industry are committed to doing the right thing. Um, I think from the discussion, whilst there are many areas of, dis of agreement, there's still some challenges. But even so, you know, we can't wait long. The response to CSR and ESG requirements does need to move and move quickly. I think only when the industry galvanizes and combines its efforts Will it be effective in its actions and campaigning? Um, to the audience out there, thanks very much for listening in. And that's it from us. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.